So if you're listening to this on Periscope, we're getting ready to go live on the radio show this week. We're uh, one minute, 45 seconds away. Uh, this is giving you a little bit of an insight behind the scenes. You will only hear my side of it. You don't hear what's happening in my ears, which is my engineering in Little Rock, Arkansas, communicating to me on commercial breaks, etc. Um, so if you've got questions or you want to make a comment, feel free to uh, post those uh, here at Periscope and we'll, uh, we'll uh, take those actually live on the show today. And you can check them out when the podcast comes out next Tuesday. We're live on roughly 30 stations across the country on BizTalk Radio and uh, hope you enjoy uh, kind of behind the scenes. We're uh, now down to uh, one minute before we go live with the show. We go live at six minutes after. Five minutes top of the hour news, one minute commercial break, and then uh, we go live. We have four segments in the show. The first segment will be 11 minutes. Second segment's 8 minutes 50. Third segment's 10 minutes 50. And segment four is 8 minutes and 10 seconds. So um, feel free to, like I said, post questions. We're talking today about predicting the future. Kill Innovations is a show about innovation, technology, design, um, but today's show, we're going to be talking about um, how to predict the future. How do you predict what's going to be the hot topics or hot technologies or even hot whatever it is for your industry and how to use that in your uh, innovation strategies, how to create new products, new services about what's coming in the future. So stay tuned and we're uh, five seconds away. Welcome to the Killer Innovations Radio Show. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. Uh, this week, we're going to do a little bit of a different type of show. This show is just going to be me. There's no guests this week. Um, last week was the, the show from San Francisco with Directly. If you haven't watched or gone back and listened to that show, I would definitely encourage you to go back and take a look at that. It's really around how to use uh, the sharing economy like uh, Uber, but applying it to a whole wide range of different industries such as uh, customer care in the case of Directly, that's what they do. But this week's show, um, I'm getting, I got a lot of email inbound off of the show that we did a couple of weeks ago where we looked at uh, uh, what was going to be coming up in 2016, what were going to be the hot innovations of 2016. Um, now, I normally do those predictions and have done them for uh, many years on uh, leading up into the end of the year, predicting next year's. Uh, work when I had my column and I was a regular uh, columnist at Forbes. Uh, part of my job is CTO at Hewlett Packard, and now it's even my job today. So part of my job has been and continues to be about predicting the future. Now the 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 the, the predictions that I made a couple of weeks ago around 2016, and most of them got validated by the buzz coming off the 2016 Consumer Electronics Show. But to be quite honest, those are pretty easy to do. It's one year out. That's all you have to look. And you can kind of look at what's happened last year and kind of project out a little bit into what's going to happen in the coming year. So one-year predictions, eh, that's pretty simple. Uh, now, but at the same time, though, those do become important from the standpoint of how do you think about your own business and your own uh, uh, planning from the standpoint of your products and technologies. Now, now, since I've done these predictions for many years, let me tell you, predicting the future is much easier than making the future. Now, Alan Kay is quoted as saying, you know, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Now, Alan Kay, if you don't know who he is, um, he was a, uh, 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 I classify Alan as kind of a futurist. He was at Apple. He and I were at Hewlett Packard together. He worked in HP Labs. Um, he was a chief scientist for HP for, for a number of years. Now, in that case, Alan's got it right. You know, you can sit here and try to predict it, but if you don't do something with those predictions to actually have an impact, 
what good is it? Now, Alan is also quoted as saying that the best way to predict is the best way to predict that future. But the fact is, is that you get 10 points IQ credit for having an opinion, which he classifies as those predictions. That's right. You can get a 10 point credit to your IQ for having an opinion from Alan Kay. Now, again, predicting the future and putting it out there is having an opinion. Now, I take the risk every year. I put these predictions out. And, look, I'm not going to get 100%. I'm get pretty good at it after doing it for, what, 14, 15 years now every year. And you can go back. You can find them on YouTube. You know, HP used to publish them every year as a video. Um, so you can go back and see how good I really was. Uh, but the fact is, is uh, the, it, you have to take a further view out than just one year. Now, when predicting the future, though, it's really the, the first step to know what you can and should create. Predicting is only one step of it. You have to get out there and actually do it. But the prediction is the first step down that path to being able to create that next innovation. So the question I got uh, in the this feedback from the CES show was really was, how do I do it? Now, if you know me and you've been listening to, whether you're listening to the radio show since we started this in July, or you've been a longtime listener of the podcast now going back 11 years, whenever I'm going to start digging in and looking at something, what is it I always do? I do it by asking questions. I sit back and really think about the questions first, and then use that as kind of the launch pad to figure out the answers or where I should be looking, or in this case, using questions to really be the key to predicting the future. So the first question that I look at is, is over what time period are you going to look for those predictions? As I said already, predicting over one year, uh, that's a slam dunk. If you've been in your industry for any amount of time, you've been involved in the space at all, being able to look out a year, you can make some pretty good safe bets. The challenge being is, is how do you take a further view. And what time frame is the right time frame? In my book, if you're looking at zero to two years, that's probably too short. It's too narrow of a time frame. Do you, should you go 20 years? Now, I think 20 years is too long. It's too long for me, at least, given you know the industries that I operate in. Now, that's not to say it fits for everybody. In the case, there are some Japanese companies that work on 150-year predictions and plans. What is their business going to look like in 150 years? In my case, the Goldilocks kind of answer that I work with is three to eight. Because typically one to two years is kind of within the planning horizon of most organizations. I look three to eight years out. I'm looking for uh, those activities, those things are kind of just beyond the horizon of the current industry and look for those things that are going to come. So three to eight years out is kind of that perfect uh, time frame for me. Now, what I'll do is I'll take those three to eight years out and I'll kind of chunk them down. I won't look at them on a per year basis. So I'll kind of look at the three to four years out. I'll kind of look out to kind of maybe five to seven years as the next chunk. And then I'll do eight plus. So I'll kind of put it into three buckets. And I'm going to look at each of those three buckets and try to look at what is going to fall into those time frames. Now, when we get done with this exercise, and there's, I don't know, four or five. Let me, I'm going to cheat it and look and look ahead here a little bit. Uh, you know, we've got six steps here basically that we're going to go through. Step one is picking this timeline. What is that timeline that is going to be the one that you're going to operate under? And this one though is the most critical. And that's why I also, like I said, look at it and break down whatever the time frame is. If yours is 10 years or yours is 5 years, there's no right answer. It's the one that works for your industry. In the case for my, in me, I work in the technology space. Um, spent many years in the consumer electronic space, which is, has a very, very, very fast cycle rate. I now work in an industry, in this case, the, you know, the, the cable industry that has a much longer time frame. Um, but in the case of my current job as the CEO for Cable Labs, our whole job is to wake up every day and invent the future. Invent the future of broadband. Invent the future of entertainment. Invent the future of new kinds of those kinds of services. So we tend to take a little bit longer view out. 
So it really depends on your industry. Again, there's no correct answer, but you have to kind of lock this in first. Over what timeline or what time period are you going to be looking to do your predictions for? So pick that out and then figure out kind of if there's some subgroupings. Like I said, in my case, I kind of look at the three to four, five to seven, and then A+. Plus. And that kind of helps define uh, the scope and the space uh, that I'm operating in. Um, and, and one step you can also do in this whole time frame is look at other people's predictions for your industry or parallel industries. And what kind of timelines do they use? What kind of horizons are they looking over? And that will help you get a little bit of validation that you're looking in the right timelines, in the right space, and with the, uh, uh, the right emphasis. So the, what we'll do is we're going to go through the rest of these steps when we come back from this commercial break. So to actually take the opportunity to take this commercial break and actually sit back and think about, is there a timeline you're thinking about? Think about that timeline, write it down, and we're going to use that through the rest of this uh, show. And we're going to, I'm going to walk you through the, all the steps that I do. I'm going to open kimono. You're going to hear exactly how I do it so that you can apply it to your industry. So again, pick that timeline. It is the most important. Then we're going to pick it up. We're going to talk about things like foundational portions of your, of your industry, the demographic and customer makeup of your marketplace. Um, and then how do you kind of mesh this all together and get your predictions in place? So don't go anywhere. We're going to be back after this commercial break. But before, you, before we take the break, uh, one of the things uh, that I want to do is make it easier for you to connect with me. If you've got questions in the middle of the week, if you've got uh, questions that come up, some of you have been emailing me, don't hesitate. The email is phil at killinnovations.com. You can send it there. You can go to killinnovations.com, click the connect button. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you. Get back to me. If you've got questions, we'll put, we'll put them on the show or I'll try to answer them directly. I'm getting more and more emails, but I'd love to hear from you. And also, if you've got suggestions for the show, uh, we're constantly tweaking this show. So let's, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. So we're going to take a quick commercial break here. And when we come back, we're going to pick up where we left off and take a look at how do you predict the future. And I'm going to show you every step you need to do. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. You're listening to Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Okay, for those of you on Periscope, we're on commercial break now for, uh, uh, what, four minutes. So um, I'm seeing some of the hearts pop up on Periscope. That's always good, good feedback that there's actually somebody watching. Um, if you've got questions, uh, go ahead and feel free to put them in. Um, just to give you a little bit of behind-the-scenes look at the show, um, my script, I always do it as a bulleted outline so that uh, I can kind of follow along, make sure I'm covering the materials. The hardest part is, is the timing. Uh, the radio show segments go by so fast, but they're hard breaks. I have to be done in order to make it into the, uh, to get into the commercial segments. So I have my script here. In addition, I have a clock here that gives me the time. And then this is the uh, breakouts by show segment so I know when the show stops and when the show ends each segment. At the same time, I have Jeremiah in my ear who uh, gives me a two minute, one minute, and 30 second warning as I come in and out of each of the shows. And then I've got kind of standard cue cards for what I say when I come go into a commercial break and come out of the commercial break. What you're seeing behind me here, and it looks like you're seeing more of the roof, is the um, is currently where the studio sits today. Um, I've actually just, we've just started construction, so I'm going to be out of this space and moving into a temporary studio for uh, three to four weeks um, while we basically completely um, build out a, a full radio and video studio here in, uh, in Colorado. So uh, follow on Facebook or Instagram. We'll be posting pictures as the uh, construction gets underway and you can actually get a little peek as to what's going on with the show. Um, otherwise, uh, 
the show's pretty simple today. It's a simple show in the fact that it's just me. Um, normally when I have a guest on the show, what I have here on the side, that direction, is a monitor that uh, I live stream in the guest using zoom.us. Uh, Zoom is actually providing the, the streaming technology for uh, for the show. And that way then I can see the guest face-to-face -face while we're doing uh, the interviews. Uh, once we get done building out the studio uh, with Zoom, we're actually going to live stream the show. So every week you'll be able to either participate on Periscope or you'll be able to connect in through Zoom, see myself, see the guest, actually participate, ask questions. Um, during the show. So stay tuned. Once the studio is done and we work the kinks out of it a little bit, then uh, you'll see us uh, periodically. It won't be every Sunday because sometimes I do the show while I'm on the road, given my uh, travel and uh, responsibilities, my job. But when I'm in, when I'm here in Colorado and I'm doing the studio, when I'm doing the broadcast from the studio, we will always make uh, the live stream uh, available and uh, you can actually participate. And, uh, and uh, give us feedback. So we're coming up on, uh, we're about uh, 40 seconds away from coming out of the commercial break. So stay tuned. When I put my finger up, that tells you the, the, the music has started for the show. I'll bob my head usually a little bit, and then you'll hear me kick in to once the music ends for the intro for the show. So stay tuned. Here we go. We, we're about uh, 20 seconds away from the next segment of the show. So if you've got questions, go ahead and ask them. Post them up here on Periscope, and I'll answer them during the show. Welcome back to Kill Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. This week we're talking about how to predict the future. It's one of the common questions I got following my CES predictions. Uh, just before the commercial break, I shared with you kind of step one, which is pick the time period that you're looking across when you are wanting uh, to do these kinds of predictions. So is it a zero to two years? Are you 20 years? Or in my case, kind of the Goldilocks time period for me that I've just found to be the perfect one that I operate in is three to eight years out. Now, step two in this process is, is you have to ask yourself, what are the foundational elements in your industry that are have an exponential impact? What are those foundational elements, something that your industry is built on top of that are exponential? Now, what do I mean by exponential? Exponential, for, you know, just to kind of give you kind of a visual image, if I stood up from the studio desk here in front of, in front of my microphone here for the radio show, and I took 30 uh, linear steps out of the studio, I'd be down the stairs and, uh, you know, some distance away. Uh, now, if I did that same, and I bet I took 30 exponential steps. So it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 um, for each as I move out exponentially, 30 exponential steps is 27 times around the earth. That's right. 30 linear steps, I'm out the door, down the steps, out a little ways. 30 exponentials, I'm 27 times around the earth. So what are those foundational pieces that are exponential for your industry? Now, typically, we as humans have a very hard time thinking exponentially. Uh, we tend to want to think linearly. We tend to think of kind of last year plus 20% is next year plus 20% is the next year versus I'm going to double this year what I did last year and the next year after that I'm going to double it again. Um, in the case in the computer industry, which is uh, where I've operated at for a big chunk of my career, think of Moore's Law, which says the, the power of the CPU in your computer or in your phone is going to double every 18 to 24 months. Storage, the cost and the density of storage is uh, growing at an unbelievable rate. 
back in 1996 when I was a chief information officer at a publicly traded company. I bought a my very first terabyte uh, storage frame, and it cost me $1.3 million. Today, you can do a terabyte into your laptop, um, you know, for about 100 bucks. So that kind of tells you those are the kinds of things that I think about when I'm thinking about exponentially. So what is yours? What is the thing that drives an exponential explosion for your industry? Could it be things like uh, rapid reduction in, in pricing? Um, and how do you plan for that? Oil and gas would be an example of that uh, from the standpoint of a, uh, a fundamental change happening in oil production um, and radically reducing what is now the price of oil. Could it be regulatory impact? Could it be you know, the, the expectation or the ability to rapidly pick up the pace or speed of service? How you make it easier to, to procure something or have it shipped and delivered? Um, so step back and think. And you, in every industry, you can probably find kind of those maybe three or four. If you have 20, that's going to be way too many. You kind of want to think about three, four, maybe five of those things that are foundational, things that your industry absolutely has to have in place to, to move forward with. Uh, but those things that are going to change at a very, very fast pace. I say exponentially, but I, what I really mean is those things that are either going up very fast, coming down very fast, uh, things that kind of operate at, at, a, at a very quick pace and can have absolutely huge impact to, uh, to your industry. So again, what are those foundational elements in your industry that are having an exponential impact? Think about those. Like I said, think of three or four, maybe five. You get north of that, that becomes a real challenge. Most industries, you may be able to find two. Most, you can have three. Four, maybe. Five's kind of a stretch. And if you got a bunch of them, challenge yourself because many of those may not be foundational or they may not be uh, having a real exponential impact. Step number three is what demographic customer segment shifts are happening in your industry? So what are some of the customer shifts that are happening in your industry? So that could be things like aging. Is you know your customer base getting older and you're seeing this progression of change? Uh, you have social interaction shifts. You know, the younger generation not picking up a phone call or phone and making a phone, voice phone call. They want to text or uh, use WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or uh, whatever. But about family structures, you know, does that... Depending on who your segment is, is the fa basic family structure shifting? Uh, purchasing, how do customers purchase? Or distribution, how do customers want the service to be delivered? So again, the question here is, is what are kind of those social changes that are happening to your industry? Because those are tend to be ones that will have a pretty significant impact. You know, so you know, and this, these are ones that, you know, don't stick your head in the sand and think that your customer today is going to be the same as your customer tomorrow. Your customer is not going to change. You know, look, you know, I was big in the, in the 80s and 90s. I got my career, got started, you know, in 80, 1980, focusing in the PC space, right, when it was brand new. And I got to ride that way for a long time. But you know, my life has changed, right? I don't code anymore. I used to, you know, it was my whole background with software coding. I don't code anymore. Um, you know, now I'm in, I'm in a different phase of my life. I've got grandkids. I'm at the end of the boomers. You know, my life changes. Your customers will change. And how do you track those? So again, the key here is, is the two questions in this segment I want you to make sure you think about. And that is, what are those foundational elements of your industry and how are those changing? So in the case of the computing industry, it's things like Moore's Law. And then that second question, what demographics, customer segment shifts are happening? What's the social change happening to your customers? And how are they changing from the standpoint of how do they buy, to family structures, to how they socially interact, you know, things like aging, whatever the social changes that are happening to your customer base, think about those. So we're up through... Step number four, there's a total of six, so we'll do the last, the last two in the next segment and then talk about how to wrap that all up and turn it into a timeline. So stay right where you're at. We're going to take a, another a quick commercial break here. Uh, but before we go, again, if you want to get connected with Killer Innovations and keep up with whatever that, what's going on and notice of upcoming guests, 
send a, text me the word innovate to 33444. So again, text me the word innovate 33444 or visit killerinnovations.com slash innovate. That'll put you, that'll subscribe you to the newsletter. I'll also send you the free two hour course that's, that I have up on Amazon. The publisher is selling it for like 19 bucks or something, which don't pay the $19. Do this and you'll get it for free. Um, and so do that. That'll kind of get you started. When we come back, we'll do the last two steps of the six step process on how to predict the future. And therefore, then you can apply it to your industry. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this commercial break and pay a few bills. You're listening to Cure Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Okay, we're back on commercial break here. Um, I think I've talked you through just about everything in the, you know, in the studio. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about the technology of how we do the broadcast. So what you're seeing here, this is my studio mic. It hangs down over the top of my brand new HP NV34C monitor, which I just absolutely love. Um, then on my laptop, I run a piece of software called Lucy. Uh, in the radio industry, there is uh, basically a technology called a Comtrax that connect that allowed for remote reports, those types of things, and it was a hardware platform. The Lucy software is basically a software version of a Comtrax. So I can run that. So I run Lucy on my laptop, which connects then to a, a Scarlet 2i USB interface. Um, off, off of that, my studio mic connects to uh, the Scarlet, which is actually sitting right behind my iPhone here. Um, and that takes the microphone input, puts it into the laptop. The laptop then streams it to uh, BizTalk Radio's studio in Little Rock, Arkansas, where today Jeremiah is, is engineering this show. Uh, Jeremiah does all the magic, puts it up onto the satellite in streaming services, and then the 30 stations that carry us live every Sunday then uh, puts it out uh, to them, and it goes out over either the AM or FM channels for each of the stations. So that's basically fundamentally how uh, it works here. The key is, is me being able to hear Jeremiah and Little Rock, and then the other piece is, is my magic clock which tells me exactly what the current time is because that way then I know Jeremiah and I are synchronized at the exact same time I know when the commercial breaks are going to happen and when we uh, are going to come out of uh, commercial break so so that's basically how it works this setup short of not my not this mic is also what I take on the road so my laptop my scarlet my iPad mini um, etc. Go with me on the road. I'll do the uh, radio show from wherever I'm at. Last week's show was done from a uh, actual recording studio in San Francisco. So there's actually a picture posted if you if you go over to uh, find uh, my page over at uh, over on Facebook. You can see a picture of me doing last week's show in the uh, recording studio. So therefore, then you can see the. Um, the work there and how that works and how it operates and what's the little bit different but this allows me to be fully portable I can do the show from uh, from wherever I'm from wherever I'm at so that makes it convenient I can do the show I like doing the show on Sundays I used to do the podcast on Sundays for 11 years and when biz talk approached me about doing this radio show I picked the Sunday slot I do it once a week um, so that kind of just kept in with my current the current schedule I'd already been working on for 11 years. And now what is now the the radio broadcast becomes then the uh, the podcast. So the podcast typically goes out Tuesday morning. We try to get it done and get it cleaned up. And uh, what's different is, is the podcast on Tuesday is the radio show with no commercials. So while you and I are talking, I'm listening to the commercials in my ear. Um and so, and just so you know, I make no money on the commercials. Um, I don't, you know, this is anything that I make off of this or anything I make off my books. 
etc., are all donated to the charities. I have two Pioneer Education, which is a um, a uh, prototype school that I'm building in Rwanda, and the other is HackingAutism.org, um, which is a program I started when I was at HP on bringing the technology community around. So we're coming up on uh, 30, 40 seconds or so till we come out of commercial out of the commercial break and we'll be into segment number three. Segment number three is a longer one. It's 10 minutes, 50 seconds. Um, so we'll go to three, three o'clock and 46 minutes mountain time, which is where I'm at. And we'll go from there. So stay, stay tuned. And then we'll be jumping into segment three. Again, I'll hold my finger up when the studio starts playing the music. You'll hear me, see me bob my head a little bit, and then I'll bring us back from commercial break. So stay tuned. Welcome to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are coming back into, um, it's been part of my career responsibilities. My job for many years has been to put together a set of predictions that the industry uses to drive or companies to drive um, its product roadmaps. Uh, my background, however, has been primarily technology, but this can be applied to any industry. It's not restricted to you got to be in the tech world or consumer electronics world or whatever. You can apply it to anything. So uh, we're going to pick up, I said there was a total of uh, six steps. We've already covered four. So we're going to, uh, you know, pick up the, uh, the the next set. So keep in mind that we talked about in the set step one, which, pick, which was pick the years of the uh, predictions that you want to make. The step two was look at what are those kind of foundational elements that are uh, that you're looking at step three then was looking at what are the social customer kind of demographics what's the societal changes that are happening in your segment now in step four what I want you to do is to create a two by two grid across the horizontals you can put kind of the um, the, the the technologies across the vertical you can put the societal you know whatever it is you can put just create the grid and then think about it in each one of those boxes for each year. So if you're doing like my case, you know, three to four, five to seven and eight. Think about, look at those exponential impacts for each of the demographic segments. And then look at it from the standpoint of uh, the technology or the things that are exponential against these societal changes. So you're going to have a big grid. One direction will be the foundational. In my case, it would be technologies that are big impact. The vertical, use the societal changes, you know, such as aging or social interaction shifts or family structures or purchasing. And then within each box for each of the years that you're looking at, basically fill in ideas. So this is what we call an idea grid to really brainstorm and fill in each box. Look at each foundational piece impacting each societal change. You'll have a little square and then break it down. Okay, in three to in three to four years, I think this will happen. In five to eight years, I think this could happen. And you may have multiple items. These could be pretty big grids. I use it on a whiteboard. Eight plus, I kind of think these things are going to happen. So step one is just fill the whole grid in. Don't edit yourself. Don't stop yourself. Don't, you know, um, halt up trying to think of, you know, why it's a stupid idea. Just fill in the grid. You're just going to go through and fill this in. And if you can't think of anything, skip that box, go on to another one, fill it in, come back. But ultimately, you want to try to get as much of that grid filled in as possible. That's all step four is, is to fill out an idea grid showing foundational technologies or foundational elements that are going to have a big impact on your industry, and then horizontally the societal changes. And where there's an intersection, fill in this grid. 
Step five is now go back and circle those boxes and those ideas within the boxes that you think are interesting. You know, ones are going to stick out. Ones are going to say, oh, that's pretty obvious. or no, no, no. And actually go through the whole process of finding ones and circle the ones that are interesting. Now, you can do it by yourself. I do it lots of times by myself. I have a grid that I just maintain. So, um, it, you, but you can either do it by yourself or you can do a vote. You can take your idea grid. You can share it with others. You can have them come up and put post-it notes on the ones they like. Um, my recommendation is you're going to do a vote. Do it anonymously. And you got to find people who are kind of future-oriented. You know, they can think out and not get anchored kind of in the past. And they can also somewhat suspend disbelief because there's always a rationale as to why something can happen. So step four, fill in the idea grid. Step five, circle those. Step six is now put them on a timeline. So lay out a timeline. So today be 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. Take all the ideas that you've circled and identify as very interesting, write them on a post-it note, and attach them to timelines. Now, in this case, you're really trying to get yourself kind of, you know, trajectory to say, okay, this is interesting in 2020. It's dependent on something in front of it. Does that make sense? So you're going to work the timelines out uh, through this whole process. Um, now, these timelines also, what I would encourage you to do is you start to pull them down and finalize them. Go out and find artwork, images, go look in Google Images, go to iStock, go to stock.adobe, um, and find some images that help reinforce what that element is. I've just found that telling this in a visual story manner has a huge impact. Now, in fact, here's what I'll do. Uh, this timeline, this ability to do this timeline right, is what this is what you're going to show your executives. It's going to be what you're going to show your boss. It's what you're going to show to investors. It's what you're going to show to your uh, technology partners so you can help convey kind of the, the this future view. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually, I'll, I'll take one of my old ones, some old timeline, and I'll put it up into a PDF and I'm going to put it online for you. So give me a day or two after this show is live. Um, and you can go, you'll go to killerinnovations.com and let's say we'll call it killerinnovations.com slash timeline. Killerinnovations.com slash timeline. And I'll put a sample one up there for you. And then you can download it and you can actually see what I'm talking about. Because this final timeline image, this is what is key. Now I've used this for 10 years. It's the best thing I've ever found to get people excited, interested. Uh, it gives you instant uh, innovation credibility. Um, it gives you a way to tell the story of the future of your industry or the future of your company or the future of your team. Um, and let me tell you, you know, I, you know, just doing this has had a huge impact on me being able to convince others to follow the vision that I've laid out. So, Again, I'll put a put a sample up so you can actually see what I'm talking about at killerinnovations.com slash timeline. Give me a couple days. i got to go find it. Once you have that done, go out and share it. Tell others your vision. You doing this and sticking your in a folder and looking at it every once in a while, okay, that's useful. Start off, share it with some people within your organization. Now, if there's nothing confidential in it, share it with people outside the, your company, maybe within your industry. Um... Get some feedback. They may come up with something that's missing off the timeline. And that's great. Because guess what? The timeline is not a static document. You need to have a plan to update it on a regular basis. You need to be able to um, show changes. Things maybe take a little bit longer. Some things move in a little bit sooner. So you want to have a kind of a regular process to update it. But you also want to be able to get input. Don't think you know it all. right? I don't know it all. Nobody knows it all. You need collective wisdom. So you have to share it and get that collective input on that timeline. And that is absolutely uh, critical. So, again, all six steps. We're gonna, I'll run through them again one more time. You can download the show when it becomes a podcast uh, next week. But step one is figure out the timeline that you're looking for. Zero to two. Do you go 20 years plus? I don't. That's too long. Three to eight is my Goldilocks period. Step two, 
is really to go through those foundational elements of your industry. Step, step three is look at the demographic social changes that are happening in your industry. Step four is for each year. Look at the intersection of the foundational pieces and the social changes. And in each grid, fill in your ideas. That's what we call an idea grid. Um, step five is now to go back and circle those that are interesting or use it as a vote. Step six is put them on a timeline. I'm going to give you a sample timeline at coneinnovations.com slash timeline. And then step seven, which is really not a step, but it's really my encouragement is, is go out and share. Now, if you need help, if your organization needs help in creating these future timelines, reach out. Now, my time is pretty limited, and I can only take on a few companies uh, that I can help with, but you never know. You, you don't know if you ask. And if I can't do it, if I'm not available to, to consult with you guys to, to create something for your organization, um, I know somebody who can help. So stay tuned. We're going to take another commercial break. We'll be right back. And when we come back, it's, we're going to talk about this week's killer question. This is a question to help you change how you think about your industry and business. To get connected, text me the word INNOVATE to 33444, or you can visit KidInnovations.com slash INNOVATE. Can I ask a favor? Can you post a review of the show over on iTunes? It helps a lot so that others can find out about the show. So hop on over to iTunes. Keep post a review, give us some feedback. We love that. But stay right there. We're going to be right back. When we come back, we'll talk about the uh, killer question of the week. I'm Phil McKinney. You're listening to Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Okay, we're into the commercial break again. So, normally in this show, in the, in the fourth segment, I always review a killer question. So if you want to, I probably have covered 20, 30 of them already. These are the questions that are in my book, Beyond the Obvious. So I actually, I'm sharing them one a week as part of the fourth segment of the show. <clears throat> if you want the entire set of questions, you can hop on over to uh, Amazon or whatever bookseller you use. And you can uh, purchase the book, hardcover, audio, digital download, in and out in five languages. Uh, but these questions are really designed to cause you to look at your opportunities completely differently, in a way that you just had never considered. So uh, as a result, uh, we find these to be pretty useful, and so we're sharing them through, uh, the, uh, um, through the show. <clears throat> and for those of you on Periscope, you're going to get a little, a little bit of a hint we are in the process of finalizing a digital downloaded version of what I'm calling the killer question card deck. Um, so you'll actually be able to get the entire, or at least volume one, all the questions that are in the book, which is like 48 questions. Um, you'll be able to get those down into a single <clears throat> you know, digital card deck that you can keep on your phone and use it for uh, your own brainstorming activities, etc. So uh, we're not announcing that officially yet, but uh, those of you on Periscope get a little bit of a, of a heads up on that. So with that, um, we are, let's see, three minutes before we come out of commercial break for uh, going into segment four, which is the last segment. And the last segment is eight minutes, ten seconds in, uh, in length. So when I do the Periscope going forward with the, the show, particularly when we start streaming it, I guess I'm going to have to figure out new content to share during the commercial break because otherwise you'll get bored me talking about how the radio show runs but a number of people since I've been doing podcasting for the 11 years I keep, keep reminding people that I've been podcasting before iTunes even existed um, uh, a lot of people are just curious about kind of the behind the scenes mechanics uh, of it so that's why I shared that today in, in today's show um, the wonders of technology allowing us to, uh, to be able to do things that years ago you just would have never been able to even consider doing. You know, me doing a, a live nationally syndicated talk radio show. Um, and uh, it all started with a podcast 11 years ago when I recorded the first one in the hotel room, or more likely the, the bathroom 
at a uh, Marriott Marquis in Arizona while I was on a business trip, and I did it purely as a fluke. So we're uh, 11 years later and soon to be under construction for a full radio and video broadcast studio, and uh, who would have known? So nobody from the Periscopes asked any questions yet. So if you've got a question, um, feel free to ask it. And uh, or if you just like what you're hearing, give me a give me a like just so I know somebody's out there listening. Will be this is pretty long for a typical periscope, and the fact that it's going to be an hour. Um, but uh, oh, yep, there, there someone just someone just hit a like that I appreciate that. Um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll take a look at this video afterwards and see if it's any good. Uh, I'll have some other people watch it and then uh, think about posting it up on uh, on a site uh, afterwards. So people who weren't here, um, you know, that, uh, so other people who didn't get a chance to see it live on Periscope can see it later. So uh, if you got thoughts on that, let me know. Uh, but again, the hope is that uh, going forward, once the studio is done and constructed, that will make these kinds of streams regularly. And actually during the commercial breaks, when I have guests, uh, we'll take questions from the, the audience that's connected through the stream. So you'll actually, you know, and I've had Sir Turn Burners Lee and Robert Scoble and uh, um, Jeffrey Moore, the author of uh, Crossing the Chasm, has been on the show four times. Jeffrey holds the distinction. Uh, Peter Goober, the uh, owner of the... Uh, uh, Golden State Warriors has been on. Peter's a is a is a great friend. He's actually is the cover quote on my book. Um, so you'll have a chance if you follow the stream. Oh, here we come. We're coming out of commercial break. Welcome to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. Uh, we're coming into the fourth segment, which is the segment we talk about the killer question of the week. So killer questions in my book are those questions that cause you to look at an opportunity or a problem in a radically different way. Uh, something that's going to cause you to come up with ideas and innovations and approaches that are distinctly different had you just thought about the problem by itself. Uh, so these are all questions. There's a whole collection of them. You can actually listen back to July 5th, which is when we started the radio show. And then periodically over the last 11 years, I've talked about specific questions. Uh, but typically in the radio show, we've always done this in the fourth segment. So today's killer question is one that actually I'm going to probably get myself in trouble with because I always get in trouble when I share a killer question and it involves a story about someone in my family. Um, so this, this week's killer question is, is can I reduce by half or double my distribution costs? Is, you know, that kind of sounds a little counterintuitive. Wouldn't you always want to be it in half? Not really. You can double your distribution costs and deliver a level of service that people then just become raving fans. So the other day, my daughter Rachel ordered some shoes from Zappos. My, this, she's my middle daughter, and she just absolutely loves shoes. She is... Uh, she takes that after my mother. Just, you know, she will collect shoes like they're going out of style. Now, she's used Zappos many times in the past. This one's a little bit different, though. And the next morning, she got an email saying her shoes had been shipped overnight as a reward for being such a great customer. Now, one of Zappos' gimmicks is that shipping is always free. But you can pay more to get your shoes sooner, right? So, hey, I'll give it to you free, but it'll be eight days. If you want to pay it for sooner, then you got to pay more for it. And they basically get their shipping costs covered that way. So persuading customers to pay more for the next day's shipping is a core part of many online retailers. Uh, and look, most my wife won't shop at a store unless it has free shipping. It's that same kind of upsell you get when your waiter convinces you to order the uh, the bottled water versus uh, you know getting water from the tap. What most people don't know is that whether you opt for free shipping or expedite it, the overnight delivery, 
you know, your books or shoes are still shipped via the same service. It's just that the goods shipped free get a bonus of going through the slow route, getting routed around. Now, FedEx and UPS have both taken an interesting step to try to maximize the speed at which they can ship you whatever it is that you want. Now, FedEx has, a biz has businesses that are actually located in its super hub in Memphis, basically to minimize the turnaround and delivery time. Little secret, at HP, if you buy something from uh, uh, Snapfish, it actually gets printed in Memphis, put right onto a plane and shipped to you. That's how you can wait till such late in the evening to order a photo to be printed on Snapfish or a coffee mug or whatever. It literally gets printed uh, right in uh, FedEx's Super Hub, goes right onto the plane, and that's how you get it overnight. Now, in UPS has customers a little bit different, but kind of a similar spin, but they focus on spare parts, and they host those within the UPS hub. They do this for auto manufacturers, uh, trucking manufacturers, you know, guys like Mack Trucks and uh, Peterbilts and those types of things, and they stock the spare parts into these hubs. And so when they need a part, they can almost instantly get it to the dealership or to the mechanic, uh, but they want to distribute them before they need it because they don't want to oversupply of spare parts. So this is a way for them to manage the spare parts but still be able to deliver it um, at a very fast pace. Now, in some cases, the part can get from one area of the country to another on the same day. You can literally, if you timing of when the request comes in. Now, these manufacturers see some savings but not by not stocking up on their inventory. And more important, they can offer a huge improvement in that customer service uh, by this quick turnaround of parts. Now, the large express shipping companies have built an amazing business by creating a perception that overnight shipping is the new normal. Think about it. Before FedEx, overnight, why would you need it overnight? Uh, I could wait, you know, three to five days for U.S. Postal to deliver something to me. But now, everything is expected to be, you know, overnight. And it's what's actually allowed other industries, such as e-retailing, where you know, people want to go to the store, pick it up, and have it in their hands. Now you can order it from Amazon, ship it overnight, and have it tomorrow. And it's allowing the e-retailers to compete with the physical uh, retail store outlets. Now, uh, now with this, this is the new normal, but it's actually in excess of what the customer really needs. I can't be the only person who occasionally fails, you know, to open an, an overnight package the day it arrives. And my wife's notorious for this. We get boxes shipped to the house every day or every other day and there'll be express shipments but she won't even open them uh, so look at your own organization what experiences are you trying to give your customers through that distribution piece and do their needs and yours align if not could they could you do something different so the sparking point questions here is what values does your customers apply to speed of delivery and how does this value change the, the change depending on the buying season and also, is there a way to use distribution to create customer loyalty? And is there a way to combine distribution costs with partners or suppliers to reduce your overall cost? So think about it. Distribution is one of those things. So we're wrapping up the show here. Again, if you want to get connected, uh, text me at the word innovate at 33444. Or you can visit the killerinnovations.com. The free download that we talked about earlier in the show, killerinnovations.com slash timeline, and I'll post a, a, a futures timeline that I've done in the past. And again, could I ask a favor? Could you post a review of the show on iTunes? It really helps uh, others find out about our show. Uh, also, check out Innovation Dow Tools. It's our store, creators, um, and uh, designers. So go check that out. Uh, we will be back next week. It's Super Bowl Sunday next week. So we will, we will be here. Um, and we are done with this show before the game so hopefully uh you uh you won't miss that and so uh so again thank you for listening to uh this week's show uh we do this show as a way of us paying it forward my first mentor bob davis uh it invested a huge amount of time in my career and when i asked him how i pay it back he said he, i couldn't and that i needed to pay it forward i needed to find others that i could mentor and share my expertise with and that's why we do the radio show, and that's why we do the podcast. So hopefully you find this beneficial, and love to hear from you. So send us a uh, a, a note, phil at com. Love to hear from you. 
Otherwise, we'll talk to you next week. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. And don't let the innovators get you down. Get out there. Turn your ideas into great innovations. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, for those of you on Periscope, that wraps up the show this week. Um, we'll post, I'll think about posting this up, this video, depending on how well it goes. And otherwise, uh, stay tuned. We're live on Sundays, and uh, when we're available, we'll put it up as a, as a uh, Periscope. Bye-bye. <laughs>